question. Let's check the audio real quick and uh, then start into the questions. Yeah. All right. Looks like we are on uh, on switch. If uh, can you verify that we've got audio callable or? Yeah, let me verify that. Stand by. We're going to click over here, and I have to turn myself on. Yeah, we're in. All right, great. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everybody to the, uh, the Q&A on uh, the Hacking Supply Chain presentation by uh, uh, Shulgi Overman, uh, Mishir Kahl, and uh, Ariel Sam. Uh, and I hope I came halfway close to uh, getting those names right. Um, and uh, I have the, uh, the uh, distinct pleasure of, uh, of uh, congratulating three brand new uh, DEF CON speakers. And so we have a tradition with uh, DEF CON where we, uh, we uh, share a shot with the uh, new speakers. And so uh, although I'd love to be handing you a bottle right now, I'll uh, ask you to take your uh, favorite uh, drink and join me in a, a quick shot, guys. So cheers on your, uh, on your talk. Cheers. cheers. Okay, so that concludes the Q&A session. Um, it's been good. good. Good questions. Well, yeah, the jokes don't get any better, guys. I'm sorry. Um, no, we do actually have some questions already uh, queued up on the, on the, uh, the chat. So uh, the first one is, uh, other than the one UPS you guys demoed, uh, what other sort of devices did you successfully exploit? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, for the remote code execution, um, we exploited two different vulnerabilities on two different devices. Uh, they appear in our white papers with uh, full details of the exploits. Uh, one is the UPS, um, and then the other one is a, called the Digi Connect module. It's a system on module uh, for Ethernet connections. And then there's a few different devices that embed that module, so they'd all, like the exploit would work the same on any device uh, embedding that system on module. Uh, but that's just those two. And then for information leak and um, uh, just denial of service and stuff like that, we exploited on uh, quite a few different uh, devices just uh, to make sure they're vulnerable. Great. So uh, we have another one that uh, you have the uh, track identified script that uh, you provided, but um, you're wondering if there was more active indicators found and if there will be an update to the track identification script. Um, so we we were staying with the same identification script um, to uh, that we've reviewed today. We have seen some false positives, and we're trying to investigate that and see uh, why um, we get those false positives. There's um, something interesting going on. The reason we're getting false positives, and we're not quite sure what it is. So there might be updates on that front, um, and we have released. Um, Together with uh, McAfee, we've released um, um, IPS IDS signatures. So I'm not sure if, if that's the question or regarding detection. But for detection, we're using the same scripts, um, which uh, anyone can can just ask for, and we'll, we'll send you by mail. And uh, and, and uh, there's some false positive um, um, with those scripts, unfortunately. Great. So we have another question about: uh, Is there a way to safety release consumer projects based upon uh, ESP32 or ESP8266? If no, what hardware development kit would you recommend to start with? Is that uh, relevant to your talk? Or? I think um, it's a slight off topic. Yeah. Um. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Uh, moving yeah. on. So, uh, what research methodology was you used? Did you uh, manually fuzz, review, or something else? I know from your talk, you talked about static analysis, uh, and I was actually interested in hearing more about how you did that. But yeah, so we mainly reverse engineered, and we 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 were starting with the track demo, and they were offering on the website, and now they removed it. And then we purchased this uh, Digi Connect device, and we found some headers on online. And uh, we had luck because this Digi, Digi Connect device uh, has symbols, so we can compile the uh, custom firmware, and uh, we have uh, we have the de debugging capabilities. 
So uh, uh, we reverse uh, his firmware and uh, that's basically how we found most of the vulnerabilities. And along the way, uh, with the research, we purchased uh, more devices and found some more variants of the vulnerabilities. So, yeah. Yeah, however, on, on the UPS device, that's relevant regarding uh, our methodology of exploitation. Um, we saw a slightly different version of threat, and we also had, uh, well, we didn't invest much in creating uh, debugging capabilities, so we didn't have a, a JTA connector or a DDB interface or nothing of that sort. <laughs> so we relied mainly on a <laughs> laborious static analysis. <laughs> Um, and also uh, um, some relatively informative crash dumps, uh, small stack traces, stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, so researching heap corruptions uh, using static analysis, uh, I think uh, maybe uh, not not traditional. Um, so had you had you had uh, better tools, would you have used them, or do you think uh, you got the results because you went the way you did? Um, well, if I had, if we had better tools, we would definitely use them. But uh, we didn't saw we didn't see fit to invest in creating these tools um, just because the the exploitation primitive is relatively strong. It's a, a controlled overflow in the heap, and the heap on this device is it's very simple, rather deterministic. So we decided to go for the low-hanging fruit first, and paid off. So. For for the actual uh, the vulnerability research, I think the um, the manual static analysis was really the way to go. Um, just because there's there were so many different architectures and different versions um, and different types of devices, so uh, there wasn't like one tool that could be used to. Uh, um, you know, emulate all of these or fuzz all of these or something of that sort. Um, and, uh, and there were a lot of special cases of different types, like even architectures that weren't supported by IDA and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think I think this was a case for manual analysis. Well, great. So we have another question. You said uh, your second white paper, is it independent of the first one or did it build on the first one? Completely independent. It's uh, I mean they're related because they're the same vulnerability. They're the same Ripple twenty, uh, but different vulnerability, different device, uh, different exploit. Yeah. Right. So for the DNS vulnerability, does the shell code have to be alphanumeric? If so, is it possible to get an RCE on other architectures? Um. Well, um, for. On the UPS device, uh, as I said earlier, we saw a, a slightly new version of Trek. You can also see this in our presentation, that on some versions, uh, alphanumeric characters in uh, DNS domain names are enforced, and then you, that's the overflow. You have to use alphanumeric characters. Uh, but on some versions, uh, it is not enforced. Um, so on the UPS device, it was enforced. And luckily, it was also the processor was also x86 based. Um, that's a solved problem. I mean, out of the market, code in x86 processor. So, I mean, it could probably be done uh, in theory in a different way. For example, you can have allocation primitives that allocate non alphanumeric data in the heap, such as just, you know, the DNS packet data, for example, is not alphanumeric and it sits in the heap. So, in theory, you could do something different, um, but we just chose the easy path. So yeah, it is exploitable on other architectures as well. Great. Yeah, I think it depends on the, the heap implementation also. Mm -hmm. So some strike versions use a uh, heap uh, which is not validated and asserted as, uh, as the UPS uh, heap. So, in these uh, circumstances, it's probably more easy. Great. So uh, another question came in: uh, Are there similar TCP/IP stacks that might be interested to look at? Interesting to look at. 
That's a really uh, interesting question. Um, so with one of the vulnerabilities, um, we're not going to say which, but we, we sort of, uh, we looked for reference in other TCP IP stats, and then we found that about half the TCP IP stats that we looked at uh, have the same, like have variants of, of the track vulnerabilities, and that's research we're going to be releasing in the future. Um, so like different TCP IP stacks seem to make the same types of uh, mistakes, so that's a, a good way to do research uh, into TCP IP stats. Um, and then as far as which TCP IP stats to look at, there's, there's a bunch, like just open Google, you know, depending on if you want proprietary or open source, just uh, type in your, uh, um, your search and, and you'll find them, right? Nobody's hiding uh, the uh, available TCP IP stats. Uh, there's a bunch of proprietary or open source stats out there. Yeah, there seems to be a follow-up question that expands out a bit beyond just the uh, the TCP IP stack, uh, since that was just a li uh, example of a library at the root of a of a huge supply chain. And uh, did you see other uh, you know libraries or other you know uh, stacks that you would consider evaluating next? Um, yeah, we did, um, <laughs> but we're uh, sort of still deciding what to evaluate next. So. Uh... Uh, we're keeping those to ourselves at this point, but we did see other super interesting stacks with a really long supply chain. Um, I mean, I mean that's how IoT is built, just like Lego blocks, right? So just take any device, break it apart. When you get to the smallest piece, that's your research target. Fantastic. So uh, another question came in, how do you explain how you got to, quote, hundreds of millions of affected devices, unquote? Um, so there's there's quite a lot of devices of different types, and we sort of try to sum them up. The majority of the numbers uh, actually come from Intel devices and HP devices, and then uh, Digi also adds uh, quite a big number of devices. Um, but we just sort of try to assess, uh, given open information, how many of each of these types of devices is sold per year. Um, to reach hundreds of millions. Um, if you sort of count all the devices that contain the code, you'd probably reach billions. If you count all the actually uh, affected and turned it on, it will be between tens of millions and hundreds of millions. Um, so it sort of depends how you count. But uh, yeah, most of them are printers and uh, uh, Intel, AMT. Great. So, um... One question I had was uh, it, it, when I look at your website, the, uh, the accompanying your presentation, it looks like there's a, uh, a quite a big team that was involved in pulling this together. Um, how exact? I mean, it sounds like the core of you all were at uh, uh, JSOF, uh, JSOF, but uh, how did you rope in the collaborators that you used on this? Um, so the the vast majority of the work was done at uh, at JSOF. Um, with Moshe doing um, most of the work from the beginning, finding of the vulnerabilities, etc., um, and Ariel doing uh, the exploitation work. Um, and then for very brief periods, um, we used some uh, outside help just when we were uh, under, under timeline or something like that. Um, most of the people that you see there, most of the names um, actually work for JSOF. Um, You'll see a few names that don't work for JSOF. One is the kid of one of the employees, um, who, who we just mentioned as, uh, you know, because his mother was away. Um, and then uh, somebody else that helped uh, helped along the way. But most of the work, like 99% of the work was done in house. Very cool. I have a really bad question. Are you ready for it? How'd you pick the name? I mean, you, you talked about in your presentation why you gave it the the 20, but um, why Ripple? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll give you the, the real answer about why 20 that nobody knows. And the real reason why 20 is because if we called it Ripple 19, then people would associate it um, like with the current uh, affair, current uh, situation. So that's why we went for 20. I mean, there's other reasons, but that's, that's the behind the scenes. Really um, just between uh, you and me and all our viewers. 
Um, the ripple is because of the ripple effect, uh, right? This one vulnerability that sort of expands and the, the impact expands and expands and expands. It's how um, we um, experienced it, but it's also how uh, over the years, Trek stack um, 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 sort of uh, went from, from device to device and, and got uh, wider and wider effect and wider and wider impact and uh, embedded in more and more devices. So uh, we felt like that really ca captures the, um, the supply chain uh, ripple effect. That's a cool one. I, I like where you're going with on that. Uh, so how big this one got? Obviously, this got a lot of attention. There were a lot of people talking about this. How has the added attention to your work changed the way that you do your work? Does it change your daily life? Have you uh, found more people are asking you questions about more stuff? So uh, it's been quite busy. Um, we've seen all kinds of responses, all kinds of questions, all kinds of uh, reach out. Um, mostly to date, most of the stuff has been uh, sort of reactionary, uh, network operators, um, um, you know, want to figure out what to do about Ripple 20. Um, and then, of course, some researchers interested in the work, reaching out, asking questions, uh, companies wanting to collaborate on, on helping uh, mitigate and fix these issues. Um, we're hoping for sort of more uh, long term, more companies thinking about the next, uh, we're calling it Ripple 21, like how do you prevent the next time? How do vendors uh, use security hygiene, exploit mitigations, you know, how do they look into their supply chain? Because I think that's like, this is not the last time this is happening, right? Somebody asked about uh, good research targets, so there's already people in the audience looking for the next supply chain vulnerability. Um, and you know, I think by, by this time next year, we'll have another one for sure. Uh, probably not us uh, going to be publishing it, but somebody will. So I think that's the, the interesting talk about like, how do we go forward from uh, Ripple 20. Great, so we have a, a question. How do you evaluate the patchability of such high level supply chain vulnerabilities down the line, especially with regard to less frequent updated, uh, less frequently updated IoT? Um, so we sort of know, it's uh, call it common knowledge or something that we say that some devices are unpatchable and some of the companies we know uh, ceased operations. Uh, some of the companies are still investigating whether they are vulnerable. Um, so it's going to be difficult. Many of the devices are not going to be patched for years just for those reasons. Uh, some of them it's difficult to patch. Um, we have seen companies reach out and saying um, we can't patch these devices for a while because they're too critical um, and like they serve a lot of customers and uh, we can't afford any downtime. And they're sort of trying all kinds of virtual patching, uh, network level mitigations. Um, I'm not sure how effective that is. I guess it could be effective if done right, but we definitely assume many of the devices are not going to be patched uh, for years. That's uh, at least my uh, personal assumption. So I guess a follow-up question to that would be, uh, you know, if you're a, a developer of IoT, what's what's the lesson to take from this? Hey, Gabe. So, so I think one lesson is look into your supply chain and understand their security. Um, you know, ask them the right questions. And another question is uh, prepare for vulnerabilities using uh, good exploit mitigations and security hygiene. Right. So some of the vendors affected uh, were actually able to release a statement saying yes, we're affected, but it's not that bad. Um, like Green Hills and uh, Intel to some extent with some of their devices uh, because they they use different types of exploit mitigations and security hygiene. And then even though they didn't know about the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities, um, the impact was lesser. So like, and then even with, with, the, with the Schneider UPS devices, which have of course been patched uh, since, um, the, the heap was, was uh, uh, got a stronger version of the heap uh, than we've seen in other devices and therefore was slightly more difficult to exploit than, um, say the the digital connect device that used uh, an older allocator with uh, which was less safe so third party risk supply chain and exploit mitigations are, are the top two 
Great, thank you. So another question from the audience, uh, more of a general research question. When starting a project like this, how does the timeline work? You say like, let's give it a month and then you give up or you allocate three people until they figure out uh, something or is it some, uh, some other approach? So it's always difficult with research, um, but we've been doing this for a while. Um, our timeline worked um, more or less um, like this. We took uh, the DEF CON and uh, also Black Hat uh, Call for Papers finish date. Um, we took as much time as we thought we might need back, and then um, we uh, um, and then you know we we um, um, what's the word we we um, we also scheduled time for the disclosure process, the coordination process, etc. And that's when we started uh, this specific research. Um, and then towards the end, towards the disclosure date, we were like scrambling with the exploit, and we actually pulled the exploit together in about three weeks uh, from start to finish. Um, but um, we, we sort of just dedicated a specific amount of time to hit DEF CON and Black Hat. Um, oftentimes it's very, very hard to, to schedule uh, this type of research. You never know what you're going to find, how long it's going to take. Great. So I guess a, a follow-up question would be, uh, I mean, did you, did you feel confident you were going to find something when you started, or was this a, mostly a, a hunting trip? Um, there's always something. I don't think we've ever encountered a target where we haven't found anything. Um, so, yeah, there's always something. Great. Um, so the, uh, um, I think you answered this a minute ago, but uh, one of the questions that came up out of band was, did the... Uh, UPS's devices that you uh, demonstrated, did, it, did those have patches available? Was it, did I hear you say yes now? They, they do have patches available. Of course, um, you have to um, um, use the to, to um, patch your device using the patches, but they are available. You have to install them. Great, so we've reached that point where I uh, you know, my, my abilities to do radio uh, completely fail me because I've uh, run out of questions. But um, and uh, uh, so, folks, uh, please, um, uh, please keep the questions coming. The last uh, eight minutes we've got here, uh, I will af uh, offer you guys a chance to elaborate on anything that you wanted to uh, add to your, your talks or uh, any additional points you wanted to make while we're uh, looking for more questions. So there was that uh, there, there was an additional question we started with of you had several things you talked about at the very beginning of your presentation of these are a number of vulnerabilities yet you showed just one would you talk a little more maybe about why just the one and any other um, things we can look forward to seeing in the future i know you talked about it a little bit but uh, there are some other questions about what are the work you're doing Um, we chose this vulnerability because um, we think it's sort of the most interesting vulnerability um, and we had a cool exploit on a demo to show that it's it's real. Um, we think it's cool because it, it will bypass uh, NAT, right? The DNS request will, will exit your corporate network potentially, depends how it's configured. Um, I think we're mostly done um, with Ripple 20 um, because um, we're, we're, you know, we're looking to our, forward to our next research uh, project in the, in the research lab. Um, there are some offshoots, some other stuff that we found out that we're still working on and we're going to be releasing uh, shortly. Um, we do have some new research that we're going to be releasing in a few months. Um, and then, of course, we do a lot of uh, you know, work for, uh, for our customers. Most of our work is, is just uh, for customers. Uh, we do penetration testing and research and stuff like that. So. Um, but from the, from the research labs uh, side, um, a little bit more about Ripple 20, some new stuff we found out, um, um, something that we, we sort of released only on Twitter, but we, we never um, um, called it documented on a white paper is, um, and, and the listeners might find interesting, is that the Trek stack um, actually supports encapsulation of IP in IP, and it will forward packets to itself 
um, if the destination address is, is the right one, um, which is really cool because that can help you bypass um, firewalls um, and um, you know and other network equipment that might stop the exploitation. Um, and, and we found that out when we wanted to test if the exploit uh, routes over the internet, uh, not this exploit, but, but the one for the DigiConnect. Um, and uh, you know, our, just our company firewall was blocking it, so we encapsulated the packets, and uh, and you know, and they they bypassed the firewall. So that's something new. Um, but mostly, we're working towards our, our next re research, and um, I think uh, in a couple of months we should be able uh, to release that. It's currently uh, under disclosure uh, and coordinated disclosure process. Great. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh your future research uh, becomes DEF CON talks. You won't get to drink at those. So uh, that, that you have to, that, that's only the first time. So um, we did have one more question come in and said, uh, is uh, JSOF going to create any, any tools like NMAP, NSF, et cetera, to help find the devices that may have these issues? Um, so we already have detection scripts. Um, you can send us an email, uh, the address is on our website, and you can get the detection scripts. And also, so let me correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we have the uh, filters for, what's it called? It's, uh, like yeah, passive, so, uh, so we have, uh, the, the, there's passive detection scripts for um, the exploit themselves. Um, we have some passive information about how to detect uh, the track stack and some active detection scripts. Uh, you can email us, them to us. We also plan to release them open source. We just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, they are also available. Um, I think uh, Tenable released them um, as a package and Zeke released yeah. them as a package. Um, probably a few others have released them as a package, but uh, those are the ones we know about. And uh, yeah, until we release them open source, you can just email us. Um, you know, anyone who's, who's uh, uh, you know, legitimate request will just send you the scripts, um, you know, take, you, take us, uh, you know, a couple of hours and you'll get the scripts in your email. Great. And if I remember correctly, your uh, contact information is in the beginning of your talk, correct? Um, I hope so. If not, it's just um, ripple20 at jsof-tech, that's jsof-tech.com. Um, all right. Hopefully someone was uh, typing faster than I did when you said that. But um, So we do have one last question. Uh, what, specifically rec what specific recommendations would you have for third-party library vendors that could minimize the possibility of vulnerabilities like this? So uh, code review would be a big one. Um, exploit mitigations um, you know, would be another one. But for third-party library suppliers like Trek, that you know rely are relied on by pretty big amount of IoT and critical devices. Um, I'd say a, a penetration testing, a really good security review and secure code review, um, as well as just security in the design is absolutely necessary because you know doing this once for track, it's just like we found one vulnerability and it affects everyone. Um, like one secure code review would protect everyone. So the deeper you are in the supply chain, or well, I guess deeper depends on where you're coming from, but the further the further at the beginning of the supply chain you are, um, the more you should be um, investing in your security, and the more um, your clients should be asking you about your security, and probably will be, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, I think uh, one of the uh, lessons from your talk was to uh, uh, recognize the fact that. These things do have, like you said, that ripple effect. And um, uh, if you're uh, if you're a maker of libraries, you know, uh, uh, you know, be careful of what what where that your code may end up at uh, if it has those vulnerabilities in it. Right? I don't think anybody building uh, TCP/IP stacks were uh, were imagining that they could be protecting uh, um, you know incubation uh, technologies or other uh, uh, medical systems that keep people alive. Right? So, so I think they, a lot of these device manufacturers, they do realize where they end up. The thing is, uh, they started writing the code 20 years ago when nobody was thinking about security. And then the code probably worked really well and just nobody wanted to touch it, right? And 
and somewhere along the line, you know, all these companies sort of forgot that, um, you know, they, they probably revamped their own security uh, processes and, and activities, but, you know, maybe they figured if, if there's something in a third party, it's, it's like a third party problem, or maybe they didn't realize, you know, they've been using the cyber for 20 years. So I don't think that it's that Trek didn't know where the, the code ends up. It's just, you know, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about security, and that's when the code was written, right? A lot of this code is, is really old, not just Trek, but all IoT code. A lot of the code is, is, uh, is not very fresh code. Well, great, guys. So we're at the uh, top of the hour. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to take these Q&As, and I appreciate all the questions that have come in on the uh, on the Discord chat. Um, any last words before we call this, folks? Nope. Nope. All right, guys. Hey, uh, we really look forward to uh, more good everyone. work from you guys. Great questions. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.